Last week and this week, I am setting the table, basically, for the series that, is, that we're in. Um, I feel like we need to get some ground rules established uh, before we be sure that we understand where we're, where we're wanting to go with this idea of revival. So the message today is taken from, Matt, or from Psalm 85 and verse 6, and that verse says, Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Is it possible that we fail to experience revival because we don't understand what authentic revival really is? You know, there are a world of opinions and un, and definitions today as to what a revival is specifically what does it do for you what does it do in you you see there's some that hold revival is simply a return to faith to some it's a refiring of your boldness and power too many times revival is mistakenly associated with an emotional experience and too often revival is are, 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 well, I should say not too often, other times they are based on confession of sin, which it ought to be because of some strong evangelistic appeal. Now, historically, a lot of time and a lot of effort has gone into revival meetings in the church of God, but little lasting effect has come from them. Listen, beloved, if preaching and prayer and especially music and singing could produce revival, then the church of God ought to be on top of the spiritual world. I mean, we've got Sandy Patty and Bill Gaither. I mean, now listen, every one of these elements that I've talked about, every one of them ought to exist in the life of a revived believer. But the truth is, none of them actually define the reality of revival. You see, to understand what revival really is, we've got to search God's Word. And the Word, the, the word of God defines revival for us in many different ways, in several different places, and it explains what is required on our part if we really want to experience it. Hear the words of Jesus. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. In John 14, he said, I, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Jesus also said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If I were to try to define revival in a nutshell, this is what I would call it. It is rekindling intimacy with Christ. And declaring him to be the absolute Lord of my life. It's opening the door of your heart and allowing Christ to re-enter. And that's a key word. Because to revive something means to renew what is missing. What has been but is not. So it's allowing Christ to re-enter your heart and re-establish his presence on the throne of your heart. That means you're going to have to dethrone yourself in order to make room for him. And often that's not easy to do because we are a prideful creature and we are given to arrogance quite often. So authentic revival and the results that follow depends just on how well that withered vine learns to abide in the true vine again. So that presents an important question. Just what is the evidence of authentic revival? Well, there are some markers that you can look to that will identify you whether or not there is a rekindled relationship with Christ. And these, uh, Wes, are not rocket science. <laughs> that was just for you. Okay, here's the first one. Your life changes. 
In Revelation 3, Jesus confronts the church in Laodicea because they had become lukewarm. They were neither hot nor cold. They were a primary candidate for revival. Look at what he said to them in verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. What he's telling them is you need to reclaim some things you've left behind. And, and look at the things he noted. Gold refined by fire. What is that? Well, this is faith that makes us wealthy in the things that matter the most. When you have a renewed faith, you are compelled to trust God. And as that faith builds, and as you trust Him more and more, you begin to look to Him for things that before you didn't think were realistic. And you will begin to experience that verse. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Then he says, dress yourself in white garments. This is the practice of holiness in the face of a world that strives to tempt us and entrap us. This is the spiritual power that's required to live a righteous and a victorious life. Listen, beloved, the world is guilt-ridden. It's depraved. And it is this kind of holiness that will make the people of God stand out in power and in might. Amen. These are garments that will cover the nakedness of our failures and our weaknesses. When there is authentic revival, there is power present to resist temptation, to deal with guilt, to overcome the fear of sin. And these things have to move out because you have moved in the peace of Christ and the joy of the Lord. And those things are opposites and they cannot and will not dwell together. So... Buy gold refined by fire. Dress yourself in white garments. Then he says, put salve on your eyes. This means renew your spiritual vision. This is the vision of God's eternal truth. This is seeing His promises. And once you see these things, allow them to get entrenched in your heart. And when you do, you will be equipped to recognize false doctrines. You'll be able to recognize the lies of the devil, the things that lead to confusion and disbelief. You'll know them immediately. You see, this is the initial evidence that authentic revival has come. Your faith is renewed. You strive to live a holy life. You ingest God's Word as you seek wisdom and vision. In other words, your life begins to display an obvious change. And it's a change that comes from that renewed intimacy with Jesus. The second marker is you'll seek out a ministry. Again, let me take you to the words of Jesus. He said, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me, is that right? No, it's not. That's not the right one. Here it is. Truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Remember, he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And then he said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Beloved, the authentic experience of revival will compel you to serve. And, and I've got some good news for you. God has a ministry for every believer. That's right. That's right, amen. But one of the most common first indicators that revival is needed is when ministries cannot be staffed with volunteers. When financial support begins to decline. When attendance in church service begins to dwindle. When momentum is lost. 
when we become lukewarm at that place, at that point, we are in desperate need for revival. Did I get too close there, too quick? Yeah. You know, if you wonder who I'm talking about, uh, we need to all do self-evaluation. Do I involve myself in, the min in ministry willingly? Do I give cheerfully and generously? Do I make church worship a high priority? How is my personal spiritual momentum? You see, your answers will, will, will reveal whether or not you're lukewarm and if you need revival. So your life will be changed. Your desire will be to be used of God. And thirdly, you will do everything for His glory. Here again, hear the words of Jesus. Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. By this my Father is glorified that you, much, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Let me take you to the words of the Apostle Paul. He said, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory He may grant you to be, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Wow, that's some pretty heavy stuff, beloved. If that is going to happen, then we're going to have to take God's Word and we're going to take it to heart. When you have experienced authentic revival, everything you do is going to be for God's glory because it is Christ dwelling in you to do those good works. You see, the change in your life will be renewed and what that will also renew is the credibility of the church. Your desire to serve will begin to bring salvation and healing to other people. And God will receive the glory. Beloved, that is revival. So the real question of the day is, is revival needed today? You see, the more we understand what authentic revival really is, and the more that we acknowledge our personal need to experience it, it will come, and it will be revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't think there's a person in this building today that wouldn't agree that we need a great move of God in the world today. But at the same time, not every professing Christian sees themselves as needing a deeper relationship with Christ. Y'all love me. Love me. You see, we're doing our bit. We attend church most of the time. We even give, sort of. And from time to time, we involve ourselves in, in a church program. Listen, maybe that's the problem. Maybe we have learned to pacify ourselves with minimal or limited effort. See, I know a lot of pastors, that, and, and, and one of the biggest temptations for pastors is, especially as they get later in life, like I, like where I am, I just want to coast. Well, I don't want to coast. I want to know that what I'm involved in is something that's going to carry some eternal substance. In Revelation 3, Jesus said, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Listen, he said, I know your works. You're neither cold or hot. Would you that you were either cold or hot? So because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. 
For you say, I'm rich, I've prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I would not have been wanted to be part of the Laodicean church at that moment. You talk about some harsh criticism. But if you read it carefully, it is undergirded with a great deal of love and concern. Why were they condemned? Because they were lukewarm. They had become indifferent towards God's work, and in place of that, they were becoming proud and arrogant about their religious behavior. Many church leaders today say that the 21st century church is most like the church at Laodicea than any of the other churches in the Revelation. And I wonder if it is not true that the contemporary church is guilty of replacing the power and the presence of God with human talent and activity. In fact, I heard one man say in 98% of the churches in America, the Holy Spirit could be withdrawn and no one would ever know the difference. I mean, look at the 21st century church and look at what it's become. It's powerless. The, the church today has lost its authority. In the eyes of most of society, we have no credibility. And the people in the world who need the church the most no longer have faith in the church. Besides being powerless, we're blind. We've turned our sight inward to only see ourselves instead of seeing the things of God. And we're naked. Our weaknesses are exposed to the world for all to see. You know, in Judges 6 and 7... The people of Israel had turned their backs on God, much like our nation today. And the result was they had been overrun by the Midianites and things got so bad for them they ended up hiding in caves while their enemies were destroying their crops and slaughtering their livestock and they ended up with nothing. And it's when they finally came to themselves that they began to cry out to God. You know, this is a perfect picture, in my opinion, of the contemporary church. The enemy is running roughshod over the land while we are hiding in our caves, in our churches, while the life-giving, destiny-changing message of Jesus Christ is being distorted and mocked and slaughtered by the enemy of our faith. Where unbelievers are captive of a sinful world, the gospel is literally non-existent. The authority and credibility of believers is openly challenged by the opponents and the critics of religion. There are gospel substitutes everywhere. And it seems like our families, our friends, and our loved ones have no idea where to go and who to turn to. Beloved, how did we, the church, get to this point? Well, I think the answer to that is also the correction to the problem. In Israel's case, they had disobeyed God by building altars to false gods and doing evil in God's sight. Even after God had revealed himself to them and instructed them specifically, don't have any other gods before me. Israel still created gods in their own image. This is much of what contemporary religion has done. God has delivered us from sin. He has empowered us with His Spirit. He has equipped us with gifts. Yet the modern church has invented its own religious idols of liturgy and activity. The Americanized church let's be honest, relies more on personal talent and skill than it does on the power of God. Amen, said the walls. 
This has naturally created a pride and an arrogance that ultimately claims successes that really don't even exist. And in striving to build up our own idolatrous monuments, the church has become indifferent to the lost world around us. And we justify that indifference with our activity. Beloved, the true mission of the church has been distorted. What is the mission of the church? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. But we don't accomplish that if we tuck ourselves away in our caves of worship, preaching and witnessing to one another instead of seeking the lost with a message of salvation. The sad truth is the church has, in a sense, become her own idol. I want you to answer me this. Can any indifferent Christian stand up to the Lord's harsh condemnation of the Laodicean church? We are in desperate need of an authentic, heart-changing, soul-renewing move of God in the church of God. We need it in this country. We need it in our movement with its national offices in Anderson, Indiana. And we need it right here at Ridgeline. And in order to have it, it's got to start here. With each one, the key is repentance. You see, repentance is a willingness to make a complete turnaround by confessing to God your sins and your pride and your arrogance while you are surrendering to His Lordship. 1 John 3 says, By this we shall know that we are of the, tr we are the truth and reassure our hearts before Him. For whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. In whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what He pleases. Beloved, repentance frees us from the guilt of sin. Repentance opens the door for authentic revival to take place. So how does a, how does a proud, modern-day Laodicean church achieve this? Well, listen to the Word. The Scripture tells us how to be renewed. Authentic revival involves seeing Jesus for who He is. You've got to recognize His sovereignty, His name, His rightful claim over us. That means you have to see Him as your intercessor. In John 14 and 6, He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There are no, quote, many roads to heaven. This is it. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Besides being your intercessor, you've got to recognize He's God incarnate. He is God in the flesh. In John 14, He said, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. If you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. Because that's Him. And besides being incarnate, He is your source of spiritual power. Remember, He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Here's the kicker. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So we've got to recognize Jesus for who He is. He is our intercessor. He is our power source. He is God in the flesh. The second marker, or another thing that, that indicates repentance, is you've got to start trusting His Word. You've got to believe what He has said. And the Scripture says He is not slack concerning His promises. Your part is to trust Him. In John 14, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in Me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will He do, 
because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. He is able. And we've got to begin believing what He said. Not just trusting it, we've got to start obeying it. You know, there were five different times that Jesus challenged His disciples to obedience to what He said. Here's what He told them. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He said, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. He said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. He said, if anyone keeps my commandments, come on. There, no, there it is. If, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And finally, he said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. You have to trust him and do what he says. And then, well, I'll tell you what, I'm having fit with this thing today. You've got to receive the Holy Spirit. This is the source of all our spiritual wisdom and power, beloved, the abiding Spirit of God within. Again, Jesus said, and I will ask the Father, and He'll give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him or knows Him. You know Him, for He dwells within you and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more. Am I? There we are. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you'll know that I'm in my Father and you in me and I in you. And here's a benefit. We rest in Him. Let the peace of Christ replace your guilt and fears. Beloved, the, the Bible says the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And that is especially true regarding your relationship with Jesus. And the most destructive weapons that he has are guilt and fear. But Jesus has come to overcome the enemy of your soul. And in the place of fear and guilt, he wants to give you joy and peace that goes beyond your understanding. In fact, here's what Jesus said. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Oh, what a promise to know that we can be at peace because of Him. And besides resting in Him, we need to remain in Him. Stay connected. Always remember that you are completely dependent on Him for everything that you are and everything you have. In John 15, Jesus said, Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Isn't it interesting that time and time again, he's reminding them and us of this. Another thing that authentic revival involves is imitating his character. Paul said it this way, have the mind of Christ. And we need to consciously reflect his characteristics. And all of his characteristics could really be summed up in one word, love. Love. Jesus said, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. In verse 12 of that same chapter, he said, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way 
I've loved you. And how, did, how much did he love us? He died for us. So we need to remain in him. And then we need to partner with him. Boy. Give him the rightful place that he deserves in your heart. And listen, none of this God is my co-pilot stuff. He needs to be at the controls, not you. And know that this partnership will have its difficult moments. Jesus said in John 15, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it. But you're no longer of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. So it hates you. Just understand this. If you're going to follow Jesus, the benefits are eternal. But there will be temporary moments of persecution. There will be people who will ridicule you because of your faith. There will be times, and I'm talking to these kids up here. There will be times that people will challenge you to show proof that God is. Let me remind you something. God does not have to be defended. Okay? God is his own defense. Just remember that whatever it costs you to follow Jesus price is worth paying because the day is going to come when you're going to be old and gray like me and the day is coming sooner for me than later that I'm going to raise my eyes one day and I'm not going to be here anymore I'm going to be standing in front of him and if I have been faithful what I'm going to hear him say is well done, good and faithful servant. And he's going to welcome me home. And you know what I'm going to remember at that point? I'm going to remember right now telling you it's worth it. It's worth it. And while we are here, that means we can live victoriously. The Apostle Paul said, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Bless his heart, Bud May's favorite song used to be, Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me. He bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. Yet all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. I remember when Bud taught children on Wednesday nights, he sang that song with, with or to those kids Every time they gathered. If those kids came out of his class not knowing anything else, they knew that Mr. Bud loved that song. <laughs> Beloved, why would you not want him to be Lord of your life? When you think about it, he is the one who has already won the war against the evil one. He is the one who will reward his faithful followers with eternal glory. Quite often we read this verse of Scripture at uh, funerals. But we need to read it now because it's one of the greatest promises we have. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be to myself that where I am, you may be also. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Beloved, as believers in Jesus Christ, we suffer when we witness the moral and the spiritual corruption of the human condition. We grieve over our lost loved ones and family. And too often, we feel completely helpless to do anything about it. It seems that our witness and our prayers have little effect on those that we love. We know and we admit that something is desperately needed. And it's needed now. We need an authentic, 
genuine, God-sent, powerful revival that will reestablish our witness and our credibility and renew our influence so that those that we love who are lost can experience salvation and healing. I want to read you something that I believe I shared with you several years ago, but it's timely and it's fitting for this morning. And it was written by Pastor Ken Howard, who is a Church of God pastor, I believe, uh, in the state of Virginia today. He wrote this. He said, Revival is a renewed intimate fellowship with Christ and a total surrender to Him as the Lord of our life. It is the most privileged and honorable relationship that any human being can experience and one that assures personal growth and a successful personal ministry. It is a relationship, however, that has become distorted in many sincere Christian believers as we have become involved with our church ministry and social activities, relying upon our human talents and abilities rather than upon the power and wisdom of God. The results are that we are failing in any meaningful and lasting ministry to the healing and salvation of souls. The solution is to reestablish a fellowship with Christ that will help us to regain the spiritual faith, spiritual power, and spiritual vision that we have lost. The solution is revival. The results will be overwhelming. Our personal lives will take on a renewed spiritual authority. Our prayers will be bolder. Our vision will be expanded to believe in things never before imagined. We will be privileged to be involved in the healing and salvation of others. And through our lives and ministry, our Heavenly Father will be glorified in all the earth. Amen. What Christian believer wouldn't want this? Well, listen to me. If you want it, you can have it. If you will seek it. And if you don't want it, then you desperately need it. See, there is a price to pay. You must repent. We haven't gotten to the place as a socialized church Understand what I'm saying. A lukewarm, lackadaisical church. And I'm not talking about just us. I'm talking about across the board. I'm talking about our nation. We haven't gotten here by accident. We are the sum of our decisions. And God is waiting for us to open our lives fully and totally to a renewed relationship in Christ. Beloved, the solution is to remain in Him. I know I need this. I know that if I find myself, whether it is a corporate move of God, such as in a whole congregation, or whether it's personal, if whether it's just me, I know I need this. <coughs> Only you can answer whether or not you need it. But God is ready and willing and He is able. He waits to pour His Spirit out upon us if we will simply call upon His name. Let's not wait until we lose everything. Let's cry out to God now. Oh, Lord God, we need you. We need you. We have never been in a more desperate state than we find ourselves in today. Every day when we think we could not sink any farther than we have, we find that we have indeed burrowed deeper into the muck. Oh Lord, we need you. We are desperate for a move of your Holy Spirit in our midst. I pray, Father.
Father, that you would you would send your Holy Spirit to speak to us and that we might say yes to Christ. We would say yes to your Spirit. That we would look deep within our own souls, in our own heart, carefully examine the condition of our heart and soul. God, and as you look at us, and you know us better than we know ourselves. If this were the day for us, would you look at us and say, welcome home, well done, good and faithful servant? Or would you say, you know, you're neither hot nor cold. You're just lukewarm. Because you're lukewarm, I'm just, I'm just going to spit you out of my mouth. That is not what we want, Father. That is not what we want to hear. Will you not revive us again, O oh God? That's the prayer of our heart. Well, the answer is yes, you will revive us. If we will repent and, and seek it with our, with our whole heart. Lord, have your way. Have your way in the 